quindi benvenuti, bentrovati a tutti. Io sono Martino Margheri del Dipartimento Educazione della Fondazione Palazzo Strozzi e qui con me oggi abbiamo un ospite speciale, la nostra prima ospite internazionale, Enico Ensolal, eh, da Pari connessa da Parigi in questo momento. E intanto vi racconto brevemente, io faccio sempre il padrone di casa in questo caso, questo appuntamento rientra tra, i, tra il ciclo eh, che abbiamo sviluppato in collaborazione con eh, il Dipartimento Sagas dell'Università degli Studi di Firenze e quindi abbiamo organizzato quattro appuntamenti che permettessero, grazie alla voce di quattro esperti, di raccontare eh, la storia dell'arte americana, di avere quattro momenti di approfondimento. Siamo partiti la scorsa settimana con Flavio Fergonzi e oggi parleremo invece con, con Solal uh, della figura di Leo Castelli. Però prima di lasciare la parola a Danny, volevo presentarvela brevemente perché ha una carriera molto lunga, molto articolata, è una, è una persona estremamente impegnata in questo momento e la ringraziamo anche della sua disponibilità uh, perché oltre ad essere una, una scrittrice, un'importante scrittrice, ha pubblicato numerosi saggi, numerosi testi, anche un'accademica e ricercatrice alla scuola, normale superiore, la scuola, scusatemi, la scuola superiore normale di Parigi e eh, in particolar modo lei ha analizzato nel corso della sua carriera la relazione tra l'arte, la letteratura, la società sempre con una prospettiva interculturale. Ha pubblicato un importante testo nel 1987 dedicato alla vita di Sartre eh, questo libro è stato di grande successo ed è stato anche il motivo per cui è diventata consulente culturale per la Francia negli Stati Uniti e questo è stato un momento molto importante della sua carriera perché le ha permesso di vivere e conoscere eh, gli Stati Uniti dall'interno ed è stato anche un momento particolarmente importante perché eh, ha conosciuto anche Leo Castelli, quindi ci racconterà direttamente alcuni episodi, alcuni momenti della, della loro amicizia e della grande carriera di questo uh, gallerista. Poi cito anche una mostra importante nel 2014, ha curato la riedizione dei Magician della Terra, una mostra capitale uh, co-curata da Jean-Hubert Martin, Parallelamente ha insegnato all'Università di Caen, di Parigi, di Berlino, di Gerusalemme e eh, anche una casa a Cortona, <ride> quindi conosce bene eh, l'Italia e la frequenta. Enni parla molto bene italiano, ma oggi abbiamo deciso in realtà di, um, di fare questo intervento in lingua inglese in modo tale da uh, dare maggior uh, spettro e possibilità Uh, di, di entrare in profondità. Quindi Anni ti ringrazio molto, che è davvero un piacere averti qui con noi. Possiamo iniziare a condividere lo schermo. Per tutti i partecipanti do una piccolissima informazione, una piccola nota tecnica. Noi ci prendiamo circa 50 minuti di conversazione con Anni, al termine del quale voi avete la possibilità, attraverso il menu che trovate in basso alla vostra finestra, domande e risposte, di alzare la mano, di intervenire e se volete poi o di digitare una domanda o anche di fare una domanda dal vivo, eh, io vi attiverò il, il microfono. Ci siamo, Enni, allora passiamo alla, a... alla conferenza. Prima alla... di tutto grazie Martino e mi sento, mi sento molto, molto commossa di essere con voi a Firenze per la mia storia con l'arte americano è stata iniziata da Leo Castelli, no? E, e Firenze è un posto dove sono stata con lui e lo so che lui è stato negli anni 70 a Firenze molto e la fine della, della storia che racconterò tornerà a Firenze. Pazienza. Adesso I am turning into English. Thank you Mar Martino and congratulations for everything. Thing you're doing at Palazzo Strozzi. <clears throat> Are you having it? Not yet. Yes. Okay. So, good afternoon, everybody. And here is um, the my 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 approach 
uh, to this show that you're having in Florence. And um, I am going to describe uh, with my own frame of um, research, which is a sociology of art, how uh, Leo Castelli as a gallerist impacted the US art world in the 60s and 70s. Um, I'm, I'm starting in Paris in 1939, where he opens his first exhibition. You see the letters are very elegant. René Drouin and Léo Castelli vous prie de leur faire l'honneur d'assister à l'inauguration de leur galerie d'art décoratif, qui aura lieu de 16h à 21h, le mercredi 5 juillet 1939. Uh, I just want to... to, to and, the, and the, the design is made by uh, Leonor Fini, who is a friend of, um, of Castelli. But I, I would just want to, to, to set the stage by the date, you know, 5th of July, 1939, the beginning of World War II, which is not exactly the best possible date to open a gallery in Paris. Well, this is thanks to her, Ileana, future Ileana Zonabend, then Ileana uh, Castelli, the wife of Leo, who was an heiress to a fortune in Romania that helped organize this gallery, which address was Place Vendôme in Paris, which is one of the best possible uh, spaces in the city. Uh, part of the art show was Max Ernst, L'Ange du Foyer here, but mostly surrealist art. Now, very quickly, because they are Jews, they flee to New York and they arrive in New York in 1941. Um, after having uh, spent seven years in Paris, they find the gallery scene in New York uh, to a total desert and a very, very provincial space. So this is where we're going to start. These two Europeans, Leo born in Trieste, Ileana <coughs> born in Bucharest, arriving and, and having lived in Paris at the height of the surrealist period, arrive in New York and, and are completely shocked by the provincialism of New York. Um, so the first thing uh, Castelli does is um, running to MoMA the Museum of Modern Art, where he learns everything that he, he, has, he, has, he has lived through, because he thinks the first thing he says that Alfred Barr, the director of MoMA, has built the collection of European art at MoMA, modern art, as an encyclopedia of European art, integrating Russian futurism German Expressionism and French Surrealism. So basically Castelli understands that in New York at MoMA, Europe is not the, the bits and pieces he, had, he has lived through during um, the pre previous period uh, in a Europe um, distorted by fascism, but it's something as a whole. And he's very excited to find that new map of Europe that MoMA is able to give him. Um, well, those rich people start their life with connections. They are collectors and they start meeting in their apartment, um, you know, artists, uh, critics and collectors. You know, here we see, we see Barnett Newman and Bob Rauschenberg, very young. Um, so that's how the Castelli start their life. And the first thing Leo does is a show as a guest curator where he shows in 1950 uh, American artist and French artist, and he tries to pair them together. He, he shows that um, American artists can do as well as French artists, you know, it's far away. And um, it, is, it was a time when American artists had no voice, no name on the stage, but the French one had ones had. Um, people, uh, the Castellis, um, you know, uh, have uh, very many friends. Here is Bill de Kooning and his wife, Ellen de Kooning. He was born in, <clears throat> in Holland. Uh, and here is Jackson Pollock, who's one of their closest friends. So this is the first part of their life, um, trying to, to show uh, to the American public that American artists are not so bad after all, they could be compared to Europeans. And um, 
they come and they just feel that those American artists that they meet, the first one are their heroes. Now, uh, it takes a long time for Leo to open his first gallery, but he opens it in 1957 in the bedroom of his daughter, simply, on 4 East 77th Street. And he, he decides to give monthly stipends to artists. He creates archives, he creates catalogs, he attracts intellectuals, students, and academics by this new kind of very intellectual gallery. This is, um, this is a staircase with a, with, a, with a dog. And this is um, the first event which happens to Castelli, uh, the first epiphany meeting, um, discovering new artists because Castelli never wanted to show the ones who existed, but wanted to discover new artists. And one day he finds this green target at the Jewish Museum. And he says that the, the texture is something brand new, the color is brand new, the name of the artist is brand new, and actually it's a green target by Jasper Johns. And uh, uh, Castelli will meet him very soon and will give him a show. He is Jasper Johns' first show at Leo Castelli's gallery in 1958, in which Castelli launches Jasper Johns as an artist, and Jasper Johns launches Castelli as a gallerist. Immediately, uh, he gets, Castelli gets for Jasper Johns the cover of Art News, and immediately the director of MoMA comes and buys four paintings by this unknown artist, 27 years old, called Jasper Johns from South Carolina, which is, which is really um, a first, an absolute first. Uh, then Castelli imposes a world world of invention with a series of epiphanies, discovering one artist a week. So you see in this, in this um, uh, dorming, in this uh, um, lethargic, in this provincial um, New York art world, Castelli imposes a rhythm, imposes something which, which is going to, to create a revolution. Uh, these are the, this is a list of the, art, the, the, fig, the pictures of the artist that he discovers. Uh, I'm telling you the names very quickly. Jasper Jones, Robert Rauschenberg, Frank Stella, Cy Twombly, Lee Bontecu, Roy Lichtenstein, <clears throat> uh, Andy Warhol, Christo, John Chamberlain, Jim Rosenquist, Donald Judd, Bob Morris, Joseph Kossuth, Cles Odenburg, Dan Flaving, Keith Saunier, Richard Serra, Richard Archwager, Ed Rocher, uh, Lawrence Weiner, Ellsworth Kelly, Hannah Darboven, uh, Kenneth Nolan, Jim Starrell, Julian Schnabel, David Sal. And here, I just want to show you this beautiful photo with Sal Twombly in uh, Palladian Villa in uh, near Venice. And another beautiful picture with Roy Lichtenstein and his wife uh, in, in Venice. <laughs> so um, here is uh, the group of artists around Castelli, uh, a bunch of young people, uh, a bunch of people that um, Castelli uh, worships, Castelli cares for, and, and Castelli um, changes everything for. Uh, you know, the idea of giving monthly stipends to artists came to him as uh, a tradition from European uh, publishers. You know, he said uh, Gaston Gallimard was giving a monthly stipend to um, to Sartre and to Camus, he would give a monthly stipend to all these people. So one thing which is extremely new is that little by little, you, I want to, 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 to support my thesis that Leo Castelli is bringing a revolution in um, the world of the artists in the United States. I had written a previous book called uh, uh, in Italian, Americani per sempre, where I showed the, the backwardness of the American art world, uh, 19th century and beginning of 20th century uh, towards Europe. Um, the Americans, because of the Protestant religion mostly, uh, had no respect for the artist. Uh, there was no link between artist and critic, no link between artist and writers. And uh, the artist was treated um, in a very derog derogatory way by um, the Philistines that were running the country, mainly the bankers and, um, and the politicians who were looking down 
um, at, um, at, at artists and writers, you see? So uh, in this uh, problematic situation that Castelli discovered, himself, him coming from Europe, decided to import the respect for the artist into the United States. And that's what um, is starting to happen here. So in order to, to make uh, the artist visible, in order to respect the artist, in order to, to create for the artist a real market that he does not have in the United States, Castelli reaches out to critics and experts and establish a legitimacy for the artist inside the United States. To the left, you see Leo Steinberg, to the right, Bob Rosenblum. Uh, what is extraordinary is uh, I am giving you um, one sample of Castelli's uh, attitude. Leo Steinberg was a professor of um, art history at Columbia University, and he used to teach Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. He is precisely uh, the, the scholar uh, to whom Castelli reaches out in order to write about Jasper Jones. Imagine what it means. Uh, so Castelli needs the best of Renaissance art scholar in order to write about an emerging unknown young American artist. Same thing for Bob Rose, Rosenblum. So it requires uh, Castelli extraordinary creativity to transform the soil of the United States and, and, and make it fertile for his artists. Another one is this extraordinary uh, poet uh, who is uh, <clears throat> uh, um, also a curator at MoMA and they all, and, and, and Castelli will impose uh, articles in Les Temps Modernes in France about his own artist. <clears throat> now, um, another strategy used by Castelli is in order to, to tra transform the status of the artist in the United States is to create a functional link between market and museum, between gallery and, and, uh, and museum. So he, connects with Alfred Barr at MoMA, this very young curator who arrived at age 27 to run MoMA. Uh, it was in 1929. <clears throat> and Castelli creates a specific bond with him. He does so too with a Jewish museum with a curator called Alan Solomon, who will have a very important um, function in, uh, in the Venice Biennial. We'll see it later. Um, Another one is uh, Henry Geldseller at uh, the, the, the Metropolitan Museum. And, and this is uh, the director of uh, the Whitney, uh, Bob um, uh, Tom Armstrong. And here we have Kirk Varnedo at MoMA. So with, with each of them, uh, Castelli creates uh, natural links in order to, to, to force museums to, to show the artist that he himself has discovered. Uh, furthermore, uh, Castelli cultivates bonds with personality. He's a very gregarious person. <clears throat> He's an Italian um, who's also a cosmopolitan who speaks five languages. And among the personalities he's, uh, um, he is uh, inviting is Salvador Dali here in his gallery that we recognize well enough. And uh, President Kennedy, we see Castelli going to a day, uh, short Castelli and tall Kennedy. It is a uh, 4th of June, 1962, 63 actually. It's uh, called the Flag Day. It's a day where they celebrate the flag in the United States. And Castelli decides to give as a present to President Kennedy a little sculpture, uh, a flag by Jasper Jones as a present. And um, um, just before <clears throat> um, the um, Venice Biennial will take place. <clears throat> so um, after having organized um, those, all those changes within the United States for his artists by <clears throat> paying them properly, by um, 
organizing for them uh, perfect links with the critics and, and the viewers. Uh, Castelli will organize an insertion of his artist in international circuits. And as, um, as, as showed in the catalog, as said in the catalog, um, the, the perception of uh, contemporary American art changed in Florence um, around um, the Venice Biennial 1964 when Bob Rauschenberg wins the Golden Lion. So here we have um, uh, the, the, the arrival of uh, the, the, the Rauschenberg's uh, combines uh, during the biennial that uh, some people will call the Beatles biennial, you know, and um, they, they, they are carried uh, by hand um, into the pavilion uh, here on gondolas and um, it was not that easy to win the lion for Rauschenberg because the French were very adamant. And uh, <clears throat> I, will, I, will, uh, I will read to you uh, what Rauschenberg said about, um, about that biennial. The whole thing seemed quite rough and natural and actually just the opposite from what it was reported to be. And it was already reported, reported to be a sort of put up job, pressures of all kinds of things. And actually, I think the whole American presentation was done is in such innocence that nothing could have been farther from the truth. Now, this is what Castelli says about that, that biennial, which has been very much talked about. <clears throat> Anything is political. As you see in politics, somebody does get elected, and it's not a simple thing. The currents, undercurrents, maneuvers, and so on, and the prices of the biennial obey the same laws that prevail when you, when you have a political election. As for Ileana Zonabon, uh, she said, I hate the game of politics that goes on here in Venice, but I think that we are going to play it at all. If we are going to play it at all, we should play to win. So actually the whole story is that Castelli maneuvered a lot in order to get the Golden Lion for Rauschenberg. We see at the center here profile of Ileana Zonabend. Uh, they were divorced, but they still were very friendly. And finally, for the first time in history, it is an American painter who gets the Golden Lion in Venice. So it required from Castelli enormous and enormous work uh, uh, because um, and it, it, it needed all his foreign languages to convince everyone. This is his little notebook that he was having in his pocket. Robert Rauschenberg, Venice, you can read on top left, interview, satellite. Uh, and then he said, barge, biennials, paintings. So he is working hard from his little, the tiny little notebook, you see. Um, and this is when both of them, I think they really look funny here are going to the White House to celebrate that with, uh, <clears throat> with uh, the president later on. So Castelli is um, maneuvering and getting that prize for the first American artist. Now, he does so too by introducing marketing strategies into the art world. Um, here uh, is a campaign of, um, of um, posters um, that were posted all over Europe, um, you know, as posters uh, of uh, museum exhibitions, for example. So they, they organized, uh, he himself, with Ileana Zorabant, those many posters, you see how um, sophisticated it was um, in order to convince the audience, uh, the public, that Rauschenberg was <clears throat> the guy to, to win here, because in the meantime, Ileana Zoraban had opened a gallery in Paris <clears throat> and she was working um, hand in hand with her ex-husband. Um, I think they are very interesting posters and very telling actually. <clears throat> Roy Lichtenstein, Ileana Zoraban. So, um, after um, the, so after 
organizing the way of legitimizing the artist in the United States, creating bonds with them, creating links with um, the museum, um, uh, making them legitimized in Europe and in the international circuits, Castelli is going to change um, the state of his galleries. He will force the evolution of his galleries according to the needs of his artists. Um, one day, uh, Frank Steller had, uh, uh, had told uh, Castelli that he had a very huge painting to bring and this painting could not get into the, the gallery. So Castelli said, I would cut my door I would destroy my door in order to have your painting inside the gallery. So in, actually he didn't destroy the door, but he created new galleries. You know, he created this gallery in Soho and he launched um, the fashion of Soho in 1971. You know, here he was at the first floor and Zona Bent was at the second floor. Uh, it was the opening on the 24th of September and um, Castelli created really in Soho uh, something like a pilgrimage. Uh, people would go on Saturdays and they would spend hours with him and he would talk and talk and talk and describe um, how um, American artists were describing the world that they were living in. So it became a tradition, a ritual uh, here we see an installation, I think it's Rauschenberg, Rauch um, with Leo Castelli and his wife, ex-wife, Ileana Zonabend, watching the installation. <laughs> now, another way of behaving of Castelli, which is extremely interesting, <clears throat> is that he would get inside information and tips that others did not possess yet. He would be, somebody would say that he would be an ear as much as an eye. So here we see him Al, te al telefono, uh, on the telephone, uh, non-stop, bargaining, organizing, noticing, learning. We'll see him behind his desk, desk with his staff, negotiating with the collectors. And one thing that I find extraordinary is that uh, Castelli went into the steps of previous very famous European gallerists. Um, one of them being um, Daniel Henri Kainweiler, who was the gallerist of Picasso, and another one who was Duvin, the gallerist of, of Cezanne previously. Uh, Duvin used to create collections for his, uh, for his collectors, and Castelli will do the same. When someone wanted to buy a Jasper Johns, Castelli would say, I am not selling paintings. I am creating collections. So he would decide uh, himself if uh, a collector was worth buying a Jasper Jones. So he would reverse um, the power game, actually. Here we see um, um, the, the way his uh, gallery was organized architecturally, which was extremely smart uh, because um, when you would walk into the gallery, uh, Leo himself would be at the back, back, back of the gallery in, 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 a, in, a small, in a small room and protected by something here that you can see um, and which is going to be written in red, the velvet rope. So you would get into the gallery, see the show, and then you would arrive to this red to this velvet rope that um, the garrist uh, Jeffrey Deich described. Um, Jeffrey Deich is here to the left with Castelli and Barbara Jacobson and another friend. And Jeffrey Deich described beautifully um, the organization of power that Castelli put together architecturally in his gallery with these following words. There were several stages to approach Castelli. I cannot help thinking in terms of inner circle and you really had to earn your place. 
In the first stage, you went up to the velvet rope, but nobody opened it for you. You were not allowed in. In the second stage, one person of the staff would see you, open the velvet rope and invite you in. In the final stage, you had the access. You could just lift the velvet rope yourself and walk in. Eventually, he adds, I became a member of the inner circle. So Castelli is creating um, those invisible uh, um, stages, those invisible um, organization of power in order to control the whole situation. At first, when he arrived in the United States, artists had no voice, no visibility, no money, um, no respect. He slowly and little by little and progressively went on to overturn this um, uh, situation to make the American artist a hero and make uh, collectors demand them. So he has another gallery, the one he creates in Harlem, another gallery, um, Castelli Graphics. Uh, as you see, uh, Castelli is um, able to adapt the galleries to um, the kind of work that his artists are doing. For example, when videos arrive, then he has <clears throat> the gallery in, uh, in, in, in Harlem. And, and also he tries to have them do photographs or, gra or graphics or posters, which are reaching another market, um, which are much, uh, much, of course, much cheaper. And therefore he um, um, diversifies um, the products he's able to offer to his public in order to diversify his own public. Here we see a map of Castelli galleries, at least you, you have 12 of them, in between uh, the first ones uptown, then going to Soho downtown, then going up to Harlem and many more galleries in Soho downtown. So <clears throat> extending his territories, you see. Now, um, Castelli also he is creating a network of satellite galleries in the whole Western world. Uh, here we see, uh, first of all, in the United States, you see to the right, Castelli for East 77th Street, Castelli Warehouse in Harlem, 103 West 108th Street, then Castelli Graphics, then Castelli on West Broadway, then Castelli on Green Street, then Castelli on 178 Broadway again, you see. Uh, so these are the galleries in New York. And then um, the satellite galleries in, in, inside the United States are in Toronto, Vancouver, Minneapolis, St. Louis, Missouri, Kansas City, Los Angeles, Dallas, and Miami. All that, um, um, the, the people who are um, the subsellers of Castelli's artists. So an extension, an extremely interesting extension in the United States. <clears throat> and, um, you know, um, many of them, of those galleries, were previous um, um, businessmen or previous uh, collectors of Castelli, notably Joe Hellman, who's now living in Rome, um, and in Todi, or Ronnie Greenberg. They were, um, they were so mesmerized by the personality of Castelli that they wanted to become him, so they became galleries um, um, on their turn, you see. Um, then Castelli um, organized the satellite galleries all over Europe in Stockholm and, and his links with, uh, with museums like the Moderna Museet with Pontius Sultan in Stockholm, but satellite galleries in Cologne in, um, in Dusseldorf, <coughs> in Munich, in Zurich, in, um, in Milano, in Torino, Bern, Bâle, Paris, um, London, and I also added the, the, the most um, the, the most friendly 
museum directors for him, like Conti Sultan in Stockholm, Edith Wilde in Amsterdam, uh, <clears throat> Brian Robertson at the Tate in London, um, Codoniato uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Venice and so on. Um, so this is the, the kingdom of Castelli, if you want. Um, after having created that status of artists in the US, he creates for them this uh, visibility um, in the Western world. Now, not only has he done so with um, his artists and his uh, staff, but he's also training collectors. And Castelli has a very interesting way to sell and to <clears throat> train collectors. Um, it is actually uh, something like an education. He would also talk, always talk about his work as educating collectors. <clears throat> Here we see Panza di Biomo, uh, the famous collector of Varese, and the story, uh, and here is down is uh, Castelli, Panza di Biumo and Richard Serra. Uh, the story is e extraordinary. <clears throat> One day, Panza di Biumo writes to the gallery that he wants to buy a combine by Rauschenberg. Castelli does not know Panza di Biumo and he answers, we have no Rauschenberg to sell, thank you very much. But at the same time, in the archives of the gallery, Castelli is pushing MoMA to buy combines by Rauschenberg. So Castelli has no interest to sell to this unknown collector from Varese, and he rejects him. Now, uh, and he tells him, well, I will put you on the waiting list. This is after the, the velvet rope, this is another extraordinary strategy of Castelli, creating waiting lists for people uh, that, he does, that he wants to test. Can you imagine Panza di Biumo uh, put, being put on the waiting list, uh, thinking backwards, now that we all know the, his museum in Varese. I actually met him and his wife. They were wonderful people. And, this, and he, he laughed at the story. So one day, how does it happen that Castelli started to sell? We see that uh, to the left, Panza di Biumo is uh, standing on top of a combine by Rauschenberg. How did it happen that Castelli <coughs> agreed to sell to Panza di Biumo? Simply that Panza insisted and said to Castelli, you'll see one day when you go to Venice, you can stop from Milano to Venice in Varese, where I have a small property, st spend some time in my country house, and we will discuss um, my buying from you, uh, Rauschenberg. So here is, are the panzas in their house, and this is where what Castelli discovers here. There's a Richard Long uh, installation here, but it was later on. So Castelli arrives and discovers this extraordinary building, this extraordinary palazzo, and discovers the, the great um, collection that Panza di Biumo has already on his walls. And believe it or not, very soon afterwards, Castelli agrees to sell combines to Panza di Biumo. Here we see Dan Flavin. We see this, I don't know if you have been there, but it is a marvelous, marvelous um, collection here. So Castelli was mesmerized by, um, by the space. Um, there are other collectors that uh, Castelli didn't want to sell, the Meyerhoffs on top. They were from, uh, they were from uh, Baltimore and uh, Castelli despised them. They said, I, I don't know where Baltimore is. In the end, they reached out to him and he accepted. And they have an extraordinary museum that they donated to the National Gallery in Washington, DC. And below is Eli Broad, who just passed away and who created the Broad Museum, the Broad in Los Angeles. Uh, I, all, I interviewed them all, they all spoke to me. And Eli Broad said, I would come to New York from LA if once a month. I had lunch with Leo and Leo educated me. So this is the way um, the collectors thought about Leo. 
those same people who would despise artists before Castelli came into the United States, you see? And because of the magic of Castelli, um, the whole situation was turned upside down. <clears throat> now, Castelli also organized his uh, office uh, and his colleagues as faithful allies, outposts or apostles. One of them that you might know is uh, Giannenzo Speroni, uh, who had the gallery in Torino, then in Milano, and uh, he was maybe the most, the closest person to Castelli. Uh, he's the one who is responsible for selling to, um, to Panza many, many, many things, and to <clears throat> open up the doors um, of Italian collectors to pop art, for example. He said, we were faithful allies fighting at his side. And here is um, Joe Hellman, uh, who, who, who had an extraordinary description of Castelli. The Dukes of Savoy seldom lost a battle, but more importantly, they never lost the war. Leo would always make sure that he was near the battlefield. He always kept in control. He rarely tried to kill his enemies, rather he co-opted them. So you see, um, the artist I showed you before, I showed you um, these, those epiphanies, uh, Castelli started to discover si single individualities, most of them um, uh, who were living under the, under the uh, worshiping uh, Marcel Duchamp, and then he, discovered and created pop art, minimalism, conceptualism, and so on. All that in order to make a coherent um, um, project for those collectors. Here we see him with uh, <clears throat> um, the Kiss Haring, uh, and here with um, the great Larry Gagosian, who now owns something like 17 to 20 Garys in the world, who was Leo's, um, let's say, um, um, for whom Leo was a mentor. Uh, this is how uh, Larry describes Leo. There's such a big change in the art world now. It became a business. It's much more global. I would love Leo to be alive and watch it today. Actually, um, Many people have asked me, and maybe there would be, that would be a question among the, um, the viewers today. Uh, what is the difference between the Castelli Gallery and the Gagosian Gallery? Or how did it happen that this uh, young kid from California was fascinated by Castelli, <clears throat> an older cosmopolitan European from Trieste? Uh, how did um, how how can you compare the two kinds of galleries? I would say they were they are actually almost the opposite, because Castelli was an artist's gallerist. He was a gallerist who would adore his artist, uh, who would um, who would never uh, put a penny in his own pocket. He never became rich. He never changed his lifestyle. Uh, he was devoted to, the, to his artist. Uh, whereas uh, Larry Gagosian is a collector's gallerist. Larry Gagosian is interested to look for new collectors, new markets. He hires people in order to look for collectors in Indonesia, in Korea, in China. And um, Castelli was, um, exactly different, uh, uh, um, exactly the opposite. So um, uh, now um, in, in order to understand a little bit better how the gallery function, Castelli created a staff of colleagues whom he embarked on a mission to serve the artists with the word mission, which is a word which could be almost religious. <clears throat> this is for example, the staff of Castelli, uh, of all the galleries, himself with his wife, the second wife. And you see, um, the, the staff would tell me, you know, we, 
we sometimes didn't want to leave the office. We would spend the night in the office. We were devoted to him and devoted to, um, to the artists. So um, I spoke to most of them and uh, Castelli managed to, to, to convince them that the ones to be, uh, to worship, the ones to, to serve were the artists. Here to the right is Bob Monk, a very good friend of mine who works for Gagosian. Well, uh, after having um, presented um, the effect of the Castelli magic on the American art world, and after having, uh, I hope, convinced you uh, about the way that Castelli revolutionized the status of the artist inside the United States and abroad, I would like to go back to his roots and to go back to Trieste in uh, where he was born in 1907. And this is a picture of him on the beach, the second to the left, reading Il Piccolo, Il Piccolo uh, the, 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 the daily paper in, uh, in Trieste to his friends. And already you see Gregarious, among other friends, always um, joking, always organizing others uh, at age 20. Um, and here are the Castelli, um, the Castelli family uh, trajectories. And this, here we get to the core of my, of my demonstration. Uh, Castelli was born in Trieste, as you see here, but the family of his mother came from Monte San Savino. The family of his father came from Ciclos in Romania in black. <clears throat> the, um, and the family lived in Trieste um, until um, World War I. Then <clears throat> they had to go to Vienna <clears throat> during World War I. They went in 1914 and they left in 1918. When they came back to Trieste, Trieste was not anymore part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but it was a small provincial city of the Kingdom of Italy. Uh, that's where the father of Castelli became uh, a banker. And uh, Leo went, um, did his studies in, um, in law and went for his Tirocino in Bucharest in 1932. That he studied actually in Milano, law in Milano. But then he went for his Tirocino in, in Bucharest. That's where he met Iliana Zonabend, uh, the heiress of uh, Romania. And together they went to live in Paris. 1935, and that's where we had started this, um, this story uh, uh, a while ago. So uh, the, and then from Paris, as you see, they leave to Cannes, Marseille, and then the United States. So um, now I'm going backwards and revealing in this flashback what there is in Castelli's personality, which makes it possible for him to revolutionize the state of the art world in the United States. There is um, a personality made of many cultures. It is a, a, a man who is deeply uh, interested in crossing boundaries and is a man who cannot prevent himself from changing um, the territory where he is importing into it um, the cultures that he has um, integrated. Um, and before uh, Trieste, back to Monte San Savino, Arezzo, Firenze during the Renaissance. One thing that I discovered, and here is uh, our friend Vasari. One thing that I discovered by, <coughs> by um, starting my inquiry on Castelli's life and Castelli's ancestors' life is that his ancestors who were uh, living in Monte San Savino in the Renaissance period uh, were Jews, uh, were uh, doing import-export 
in these small communities in Tuscany, and they were responsible for creating an extraordinary um, commercial and, and, and financial life in those little villages. Monte San Savino is not a village, it's a city. But they used uh, the fact that there was no dogana, no, no taxes, to, to increase the um, financial life of the city. So they traveled all over Tuscany. And one of the things the brothers Castelli were doing where they were selling paper to, to artists and to painters. So it seems to me that uh, they were agents traveling between states and <clears throat> uh, crossing boundaries between uh, the world of finance and the world of art. So five centuries before Castelli does so in the United States, his ancestors were already involved in, um, in, in that kind of work as agents. And uh, I, I want to also tell you that, back to Florence, that Leo Castelli always told me that his mentor was Leo Battista Alberti. And he said, when I was a child, I, would, I read biographies about Alberti and I wanted to be like him because I read that he could throw a stone higher than the Campanile in Florence. And he was my role model. So he loved the, the fact that um, Alberti was altogether a philosopher, um, an architect, a builder, and a theoretician and a writer. So Castelli was completely imbued with those, um, those models. So much so that he managed also to inscribe his own name in history and revisits the narrative of American art. This is Rauschenberg in his studio when nobody was going, nobody was looking at his art among his combines. We see here, behind him, you see the very combine that Panza di Bumo has bought. And to the right, you see bed that we're going to talk now. So Castelli is responsible for putting uh, Rauschenberg on the map, but until that time, at MoMA, they were not interested in buying new combines by Castelli until 1988. So what does Castelli do? He changes the narrative of MoMA and he donates that bed that he bought himself for $1,000. He donates it at the time it was $11 um, million. He donates it to MoMA and he says, I want you to change the narrative of American art. So here he is, a little picture when he donates the bed. This is a picture of bed. This is, these are the viewers watching bed and this is um, the, the label. Robert Rauschenberg, American born 1925. Bed combined painting, oil and pencil and pillow, quilt and sheet on wood supports. Gift of Leo Castelli in honor of Alfred Barr, 1989. So you see um, how Castelli uh, forces <clears throat> everything to happen by his intelligence, by his wit, by his creativity, by his importing models from Europe, <clears throat> and by treating American artists as artists were treated in Florence during the Renaissance. He became an icon. This is the Mezzogiorno restaurant in Soho. Uh, this is, um, <clears throat> this is um, um, a very interesting race where the, 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 the horse who won was called Leo Castelli. He's holding that. And this is also a mug called Leo Castelli for him, <clears throat> made by an artist, as you see, Frank Stella, um, Roy Lichtenstein, Andy Warhol, uh, Jasper Jones, and Rauschen, and Rauschenberg at the bottom. So here is him. He he is in this book, and here is the book in English. His portrait by Mapplethorpe, and his portrait by Mapplethorpe at the gallery in in Trieste, the Nadia Bassanese gallery, where he was, <clears throat> where his uh, photo was printed on a curtain, and it comes out of the curtain. So that's what I try to do 
with the work on Castelli. I tried to understand what was inside the Castelli that things that he would not tell us, but that I tried to discover. This is the end of uh, my little presentation. I, I think I'm right in time. So um, this is Leo Castelli uh, with his uh, Tuscan ancestry uh, uh, coming back to Florence to celebrate American Art 1961-2001. And uh, wanting to, I wanted to, to show you how he revolutionized the status of the American artist. He imposed them worldwide. Uh, by exporting European cultural models into the United States. Thank you. Okay, Martino, finito. Here we are. Thank you so much. It was a, a brilliant and, and beautiful ride towards the Castelli lives. And you gave us a very interesting and detailed analysis of many artists that we are presenting in our show right now in Florence. So it was very pleasing to see some of the artworks that you can experience actually in Florence in our exhibition at Palazzo Strozzi, how they came alive thanks to Leo Castelli. So I'm switching to Italian. Um, Grazie ovviamente Annie per questa bellissima presentazione, questa cavalcata attraverso la vita, il lavoro, la carriera di, di, di Leo Castelli e uh, quello che uh, mi premeva era dire che tanti dei lavori di cui hai parlato sono presenti, sono presenti in mostra, tanti degli artisti da Uh, da Robert Mappeltorp con cui abbiamo concluso questo intervento a tutta la sala dei, degli artisti dedicati alla pop art tanti artisti uh, del, uh, del minimal abbiamo Jasper Jones abbiamo Robert Rauschenberg quindi è proprio un'immersione tra le scoperte di, questo, di questo, questa figura così importante allora noi siamo stati precisissimi sono le sette adesso e se ci fosse qualcuno tra i nostri partecipanti che fosse interessato a fare una domanda, molto molto volentieri, siamo qui per qualche altro minuto a disposizione. E potete usare il tasto alza la mano o potete usare la, uh, lo spazio domanda e risposta uh, per uh, così aprire ulteriormente delle delle domande, delle questioni su questa importantissima figura. Mentre aspettiamo l'eventuale partecipazione degli ospiti, ti faccio subito io una domanda, mi permetto di fartela in italiano, tanto lo capisci benissimo. Um, tra tutti gli artisti uh, con cui lui ha lavorato, uh, c'erano anche artisti europei com come Cristo che ci ha fatto vedere, ma poi principalmente erano americani. Um, escludendo Robert Rauschenberg e Jasper Jones con cui lui ha avuto questa, quest questa grande anche amicizia, ma qual quali sono gli altri artisti che secondo te uh, lui ha maggiormente promosso o con cui ha, che ha contribuito a creare anche il loro mito? Assolutamente c'è uh, Frank Stella, Roy Lichtenstein e Andy Warhol, assolutamente. Frank Stella l'ha scoperto Castelli molto molto giovane e, e uno che non piaceva a, alle due primi che erano Jasper Jones e Rauschenberg. Uh, loro hanno detto che questo cartoons di, Frank, di, di, di Roy Lichtenstein non, non, è, non le piacevano. E, però Leo ha insistito e è stata una, una bellissima storia perché uh, Roy Lichtenstein ha, ha saputo inserire nelle sue, nella, nella, nella sue pitture um, delle opere maggiori dell'arte europeana, no? uh, per esempio Matisse, per esempio Picasso, per... 
allora lui è... io voglio, voglio spiegare che sono diversi lui eh, Castelli ha iniziato con due figure um, um, sotto la, il segno di Duchamp, che sono Jasper Jones e Rauschenberg, e poi altri che, che, fanno organ, che organizzano il gruppo della pop art, tra le quelle um, Roy Lichtenstein, Andy Warhol e tutti gli altri. Allora, la, 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 la cosa intelligente di Castelli è di aver saputo includere uh, tutti i movimenti, inc incluso i, i, i altri che eravano dopo, in, nella stessa galleria, capisci? Perché lui ha fatto andare l'arte americana molto più veloce, che lui ha, ha imposto all'arte americana un ritmo che non aveva per niente. Era un po' difficile tra gli artisti, però la cosa che, che, che era una meraviglia per tutti era questa, questa velocità a cui lui scopriva. E anche era l'eccellenza della galleria, perché venivano, mi ricordo, venivano studenti che facevano il PhD da Harvard per vedere alla Galleria Castelli gli archivi eh, i, i documenti, um, i cataloghi e diventava proprio un'istituzione uh, di grande livello accademico e, 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 e lui allora ha, ha, ha proprio creato qualcosa che non esisteva uh, tra gli artisti, il pubblico, gli artisti, la galleria, gli la galleria e il museo e, e proprio creare una rete intera uh, per, per uh, far esistere questo, 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 questa arte di questi anni 60 e 70. Anche di più direi che l'arte americana non si vendeva per niente uh, nelle grandi auction houses, per niente non si vendeva. La prima mostra che ha iniziato a vendere l'arte americana era nel 74, la mostra della collezione di Skulls. E da questo momento ha iniziato a andare avanti la, uh, i prezzi dei pittori americani. Questa cosa è, è impossibile di pensare adesso, è impossibile di pensare che non si vendevano queste tecniche, capisci? Perciò Castelli ha proprio fatto un, un, un lavoro straordinario tra, e devo dire che questa galleria che si chiamava Art Tapes 22, di Maria Gloria Bicocchi via Ricassoli, no? 22, a Firenze, tra 72 e il 76, era collegata alla Galleria di Castelli, eh, era l'inizio del video art. Castelli era uno, un uomo vecchio, ha iniziato a aprire la galleria con 50 anni, no? e il video art è arrivato, lui aveva 70 anni, ma lui, lui ha detto, va bene, interessantissimo, lui ha, aperto, ha pre preso rischi, capisci? e si è messo a, a collegarsi con questa giovane gallerista di, di Firenze, che è una cosa straordinaria proprio. Creare questa rete dappertutto. Ma mi, mi immagino che forse è un po' difficile per i, la gente che ascolta se il mio inglese non era perfetto, no? Allora era difficile da, ero difficile da capire, pensi tu? No, no, abbiamo, abbiamo capito molto bene. Poi avevi un repertorio di immagini eh, che ci ha dato proprio quest, questi, questi spiragli, questi, come se avessimo spiato la vita di Leo Castelli in questa, in questa lunga carriera. E anche mm. questa, questa conclusione che ci hai dato, uh, parlando proprio di questa sua intelligenza, questa sua apertura e questa sua volontà di scoprire Come costantemente l'arte. Questa missione che proprio viene da Firenze. Perciò penso che, che è un momento giusto, un posto giusto per ricordare tutto questo e la, e la, e la, e la, e la, e la posizione fiorentina, rinascimentale, che ha, ti immagini che nessun americano conosce la geografia. 
nessuno sa dove Trieste, nessuno sa, capisci? E, e perciò è incredibile che, che lui sia, abbia potuto uh, fare questa rivoluzione, che chiamo veramente una rivoluzione. Enni, io ti ringrazio molto perché è stata una panoramica molto bella e con queste parole abbiamo chiuso perfettamente il percorso, siamo partiti da Trieste, ci siamo spostati in tutta Europa, negli Stati Uniti e poi torniamo finalmente a Firenze, e quindi grazie ancora, noi ti ospiteremo presto per una visita in mostra quando avrai tempo di venire in Toscana. E nel frattempo io ringrazio tutti coloro che hanno partecipato e noi ci vediamo la prossima settimana con il terzo intervento del ciclo. Vi ricordo che il link che avete è lo stesso che potete utilizzare sempre per partecipare a questi appuntamenti o altrimenti iscrivervi o condividere eh, con, eh, con gli amici, con i colleghi, con gli appassionati d'arte questi momenti di approfondimento. Se ci sono domande dopo, mi le mandi, ok? Se qualcuno ci volesse scrivere delle domande, molto volentieri, perché c'è sempre un momento di imbarazzo, eh, nonostante la distanza, può scrivere a edu, edu, chiocciola, palazzostrozzi.org, e io con piacere girerò a Danny le vostre domande. Grazie a tutti, buona serata, e ci vediamo la prossima settimana. Di nuovo grazie, Annie. Grazie Martino, a presto, ciao. Ciao.